Okay, so when we last left off, we were discussing the idea of activation energy and reaction rates. Well, the Arrhenius equation relates the activation energy to our reaction rate constant. So this is the following relationship. You should have seen this in Chem 102, General Chemistry 2. Um, the key point that we're trying to take away from this idea of activation energy is that the reaction pathway with a smaller activation energy will occur faster and more product from that pathway will be preferentially generated. Okay. Now, what's really important when we consider and look at chemical reactions is what's known as the rate limiting step. The rate limiting step is the slowest reaction step, generally with the largest activation energy. So the rate limiting step and the key feature of the rate limiting step, it controls the product selectivity for our reaction. Okay, so in a lot of the chemical reactions we're going to look at in this chapter and in later chapters, we're going to be focusing on the rate limiting step to help us understand product selectivity and preferential reactivity. Okay, so reaction conditions can produce different products depending on the temperature, reaction enthalpy, and reaction entropy. So we talk about products in terms of kinetic versus thermodynamic. So the kinetic product is the product generated from the faster reaction pathways, the lower activation energy. So for example, so if we, if we look at this graph, if we pay attention to the, to the trace in green, so this is our Gibbs energy of activation, it's our activation energy for reaction one, okay? And here is our delta G overall for our reaction. Let's compare to reaction two. Here's our delta G, Gibbs energy of activation for our reaction. And this smaller jump is our delta G for reaction two. So as we notice, our kinetic product in this case, which is the product in green. So green is our kinetic product because it has a lower activation energy. And as a result, this product is preferentially generated. You don't generate the lowest energy product necessarily. You generate the product with the lowest activation energy to reach that product. Does that make sense? The thermodynamic product, quite simply, is just the lower energy product. So here we're looking at the overall Gibbs energy of reaction. Well, for the kinetic product, the kinetic product cares about the Gibbs energy of activation or our activation energy. Okay, does everyone understand the distinction between thermodynamic and kinetic product? Is everyone comfortable with this idea so far? Everyone's pretty quiet in the chat right now. Okay, perfect. So it's really key to identify if a reaction is an under kinetic or thermodynamic control. So to talk about what that means, um, at higher temperatures, at higher temperatures, the activation barrier is more easily surmounted. So essentially at higher temperatures, your reaction energy is your reactant energy is a little bit higher. And as a result, both since our both our reactants and our products are at higher energy because we're at a higher temperature and because our molecules itself have more kinetic energy, we are able to more readily surmount our activation energy barrier. So the kinetic product is able to undergo a reverse reaction and then a forward reaction through the higher energy, higher activation energy path to generate the thermodynamic product. Um, so we call this idea where you 
increase the overall temperature of your system or you modify your reaction conditions to allow your kinetic and thermodynamic product to be interconverted. We call these conditions equilibrating conditions. So essentially what we do is if we increase our temperature, so at higher temperatures, so let's just note at higher temperatures, essentially we are raising we are raising the energy of our reactants and products. So at higher temperatures, our reactant and product energy increases. And as a result, what's going to happen is that our delta G activation will decrease relative to our reactant. So because our activation barrier is lower at higher temperatures, because it's lower at higher temperatures, we can just as easily now funnel our kinetic product back to our reactant and then through the higher energy pathway to yield our more stable thermodynamic product. Does this idea make sense? Does everyone understand how modifying the temperature can affect our activation energy? Does this make sense to everyone? Okay. So it, it affects our activation energy by virtue of the fact we're providing our reactant and product molecules with more energy, so they're more readily able to surmount this activation barrier. And we see this based on the fact that equilibrium constants are temperature dependent makes sense. Okay, so this is really a seminal idea in organic chemistry. This is probably the most useful fundamental postulate you'll be seeing in organic chemistry with regards to understanding reaction mechanisms. And it's this idea of the Hammond postulate, which essentially says the structure of a transition state resembles the structure of the nearest stable species. So transition states for endergonic, so delta G greater than zero, structurally resemble products, okay? While transition states for exergonic steps, which has a delta G of less than zero, resemble our reactants, okay? So fundamentally, the short version of the Hammond postulate is a transition state should be similar to an intermediate reactant or product that is close in energy to the transition state. Okay, so just as a refresher, once again, endergonic reactions, delta G greater than zero, our transition state resembles our products, okay? Does everyone notice, does everyone notice how the difference in energy between our product and the transition state is smaller than the difference in energy between our reactant and our transition state. Does everyone notice how the product is closer in energy? Okay, so just to, just to put some labels here. So this is the Gibbs energy of activation from reactant to product is just our Gibbs energy. And this is the Gibbs energy of activation of our reverse reaction, okay? Wonderful. So, one thing that we can, can do with this idea of endergonic transition states is we can look and see. So if we have the same reactant, so we have the same reactant and we have two products. So let's, let's put some colors to that. So let's call this B and the green product will be product A. Okay, so one thing that we can look at is we can, we can deduce the relative energy of our transition states based on the fact that we know that for both of these reactions, delta G is greater than zero. These are endergonic reactions, right? Does everyone agree with that point? So then, if I told you that our transition state resembles our product for an endergonic reaction, so if our transition state 
resembles our product for an endergonic reaction, we'd expect, so for A, so A is our lower energy product. Okay, what does that tell us a little bit about the transition state? If the transition state resembles our product, Will the transition state for A be lower or higher in energy? Would we, what would we be able to draw from that? Would we expect the transition state, so this transition state here, would we expect it to be lower or higher in energy? Lower, yes. They resemble in energy, stability, and structure the closest energy species. So our lower energy product, would we would expect to see a lower energy transition state. So we can use the relative energy and relative stability rules for our intermediates to postulate and propose the relative energy of our transition states. So for B, we have a higher energy product. And that in turn leads to a higher energy transition state. So by looking at the products of our reaction, we can get a sense for an endergonic reaction, which species will be generated more readily by comparing their activation energy. And as we can see very clearly, the Gibbs energy for activation for A is less than the Gibbs energy for activation for B. Ergo, Ergo, as we see very clearly, A is preferred. Does this make sense to everyone? Does this analysis make sense? Again, the transition state resembles the closest energy species. In this case, we're comparing intermediates. The lower energy intermediate, in turn, the transition state resembles that intermediate in that it will have a lower energy transition state. That's why product A is generated preferentially. Yes, yes, lower activation energy for a reaction make, ensures that that product is generated preferentially, yes. The product with the lowest activation energy to reach that product is preferentially preferred under kinetic conditions, yes. That's exactly right. And what we're doing here is we're comparing and we're using our reactants and products in the Hammond postulate to estimate the energy of our transition states, which in turn allows us to estimate the preferred product. So the logic is not A is preferred because it's lower in energy. The logic is A resemble, our transition state resembles A, our transition state is lower in energy, ergo, a is generated faster. Does everyone catch that line of logic? Does everyone understand what I'm getting at here? The thing that controls product preference is our transition state. Is everyone comfortable with this idea? Okay, now you're gonna have to be really careful when you move on to this next class of reaction. These are known as exergonic reactions. Exergonic, Gibbs energy is less than zero, release energy. The transition state resembles the reactants. Okay, so I'm just gonna put some labels here. So here's our delta G. Here's our delta G activation. And all the way up to here is our delta G activation for the reverse reaction. Does everyone notice how the transition state is closer in energy to our reactants? Does everyone notice how our transition state is closer in energy to our reactants? Does that make sense to everyone? In this picture for the exergonic, does everyone notice how the reactant is closer? Okay, so the transition state is going to resemble our reactants. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this as this is, this is where you can see some really funny behavior for exergonic reactions. So here's our reactant. Okay. So here's our reactant and we have two transition states, two transition states. 
B and A. Okay. Does everyone already start to notice something a little bit funny with this picture? So let, let's take a look at this. So we have our products. So these are our products. Okay. For an exergonic reaction. So let's let's dissect this picture in detail. Let's talk a little bit about this step by step. So looking at our products, do our products matter at all in terms of our intermediate? Uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. Do our products from this first step matter at all in terms of our transition state? So if we look at the idea of our exergonic reaction, what does our transition state resemble? Our transition state resembles what? Our reactants. Okay, so for B, our transition state resembles reactants. And in this case, B has a higher energy transition state. We'll look at a few examples in this category. For pathway A, again, for A, the transition state resembles our reactants, but it's a lower energy transition state. And because A goes through a lower energy transition state, product A is preferred. Okay, so when you go from the same reactant and you have two competing reaction pathways, you're going to have to remember that, and we'll see this when we start drawing our transition states, that our transition state will resemble our reactant proceeding through these two different reaction pathways. So our, our transition state will look structurally similar to our reactant. The main point of this picture is to show that even though we can clearly see that B has a lower energy product because this is an exergonic reaction, because this is an exergonic process, we're going to have to be a little bit careful when we're assigning our preferred and our preferred or less preferred product. We'll see some examples of exergonic reactions a little bit later on. Okay, so just, just always be careful in terms of classifying your reactions. So if a reaction occurs in more than one step, if a reaction occurs in more than one step, it must involve species that are neither the reactant nor the product. We call these species intermediates. Okay, so a classic example is in um, alkene addition reactions, you often go through a carbocation intermediate. Intermediates are typically drawn in brackets. They are not isolable species. You can't fish out and have a flask with that carbocation sitting stable. They're temporary fleeting species that are generated over the course of a reaction that then react further in subsequent steps. Okay, so let's 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 look let's look at um, let's look at this reaction in detail. Let's look at this reaction in detail, and let's try to assess what do we see. What do we see? So we have our Gibbs energy of activation for step one. So this is step one. This is step two. Would someone like to tell me, just looking at our Gibbs energy of activation, which step is rate limiting? Step one or step two? What step is rate limiting? What is our slowest reaction step with the highest activation energy? What is our slowest 
one, exactly. So step one is rate limiting. Why? It's delta G1, delta G activation one is greater than the Gibbs energy of activation for step two. Okay, so we can, we can now really just focus on this first part of our reaction, okay? So let's look at step one in detail. Let's look at step one in detail. So classifying step one, which is rate limiting. My question to all of you is, is this an exergonic or endergonic step? Is it exergonic or endergonic? Is it absorbing or releasing energy? Ender, endergonic, exactly right. And the way that we can tell that is that the delta G for step one is greater than zero. So delta G for step one is greater than zero. So it's endergonic. So then for our transition state, will our transition state resemble our reactants or our product? Our transition state resembles what? Our reactants or our products? Products, exactly right. Okay, so the key thing here is when you're, when you're thinking about product selectivity, you focus on your rate determining step or rate limiting step and you classify whether the transition state and as a result your, your transition state resembles your reactants or your product. Since it's endergonic, our transition state resembles our products. So we're gonna use our relative product stability to calculate and estimate our Gibbs energy of activation. Does this idea make sense? Does, does this process make sense to everyone? You focus on the rate limiting step and you look and you think, what does my transition state resemble? And that's based on whether your reaction is exergonic or endergonic. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. Um, so the intermediate, often will look very similar to your transition state drawn, okay? Each step has its own Gibbs energy of activation and a complete diagram for a reaction shows the free energy changes associated with an intermediate as well. Okay. So in essence, here's what you're going to do. You're gonna identify whether a reaction is exer or endergonic for each step. Okay, so if we see an exergonic step, so when I use the word reaction, also think about the word step, we can estimate the relative energy of the transition states by looking at the relative energy So in this case, if we're looking at exergonic, so for exergonic, we care about the reactants. For an endergonic step, we can look at the relative energies of our products. Okay. So let's do some examples now. The faster reaction has the lower activation energy, so the lower Gibbs energy of activation. The activation energy depends on the difference in energy between the transition state and the reactant energies, okay? So let's look at an example for the first step of a addition reaction. So. Let's label our Gibbs energies of activation for pathways A and B. Notice the activation energy is the difference between our reactant and our transition state. Okay, now looking at this reaction, 
Is this reaction exergonic or endergonic? Is this reaction step exergonic or endergonic? So this first step, it's endergonic, okay? So endergonic, ergo, our transition state resembles our products, okay? So we're gonna look at our product. So if we compare product B to product A, so these are, these are intermediates. So these guys are intermediates. Okay, these are the products from the first step. These are intermediates generated from the first step. So our reactants for both of these reactions are exactly identical, okay? So we don't have, so our reactants we're not caring about as much right now. However, if we think about our two possible reaction pathways for this addition reaction, we, can, we, we end up with a choice. We can either generate a carbocation such as structure B or a carbocation such as structure A. So from our experience, which carbocation is lower in energy? A primary or a tertiary carbocation? Which carbocation is lower in energy? primary or tertiary? So I see a lot of people saying, let's get a few more responses in the chat. Which carbocation is more stable, A or B? Which carbocation is lower in energy, A or B? A, overwhelmingly A is the lower energy carbocation because tertiary, Carbocations are lower in energy than primary. So as a result, as a result, for our transition state for A, our transition state for A, as a result, is lower in energy because it resembles our lower energy product. Ergo, the faster reaction will occur to generate product or intermediate A. So let's, let's talk through this one more time. So for the following endergonic reaction, the reaction that generates the lower energy product in turn has a lower energy transition state that resembles the product. Since the transition state is lower in energy, the activation energy is lower. So in turn, we can conclude the reaction that produces the most stable carbocation occurs at a faster rate, favoring the tertiary carbocation product. So that's our kicker for this addition process. So the, the, the step that generates our tertiary carbocation will occur faster because our intermediate is low in energy. And as a result, our transition state is lower in energy, which leads to a faster reaction. Does that make sense to everyone? Is everyone comfortable with this idea? Okay. Okay, so we're gonna do an interesting case study. And this is important because, yes, the transition state is inextricably linked to activation energy. So the activation energy is the energy difference between our reactant and our, tr and our transition state. Yes. Did that answer your question? Okay, perfect. Okay, so we're gonna do a case study here and this is a beautiful classical study into this idea of the Hammond postulate. I really enjoyed um, reading through this in the book and some other sources. So I'd like you to recall for radical reactions, we have a series of steps. So initiation, where we generate our radical. Propagation, where we end up abstracting radicals and generating new radicals. And then finally, termination steps, where our radicals combine. Okay, perfect. You don't have to worry too much about all, all of these steps. In the end, we can take a hydrocarbon and install a halogen. Now, these reactions are notoriously non-selective. However, by being very careful with our conditions, we can observe some quite interesting selectivity preferences. 
So let's look at radical chlorination versus radical bromination. Okay, so let's suppose we have our normal hydrocarbon and we are trying to chlorinate. Well, there are two distinct types of hydrogens at play. We have our secondary hydrogens and we have our primary hydrogens, right? Okay, so just doing a count, just doing a count really quickly, we see that we have a total of six primary hydrogens and two secondary. Whoops, I forgot my one. There we go. Okay. So statistically, a six to two ratio. So it's statistically, we'd expect, we'd expect six, a six to two ratio of secondary to, sorry, of primary to secondary, okay? Since we have six primary and two secondary. So statistically, we have about three times the number of primary hydrogens. Um, and to answer your question for primary, secondary, or tertiary, it's based on the number of carbons attached. So in this case, uh, this hydrogen is attached to a carbon that's only attached to one carbon. That's why we call this primary. Well, this, car this carbon here is attached to two carbons, so the hydrogens attached would be secondary. Does that make sense? Did that address your question? So you look at the carbon that substituent is attached to. Yes, exactly right. So a primary hydrogen is attached to a primary carbon. That's exactly right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Did that clear up the question? Okay, so um, what I want you to consider is just statistically, um, just like if you, were, if you were playing roulette, if you have six to two odds, there are six times, there are six, there are six primary hydrogens to choose from and only two secondary. So statistically, we'd expect a roughly 75% of our chlorination cases to occur at the primary. In reality, we see only 45% occur at the primary and 55% occur at the secondary. So what does this tell us? What does this tell us a little bit? Is chlorination biased? Is, is chlorination biased towards certain carbons? Does chlorination, looking at this data, prefer the primary or secondary? If we compare the statistical to the actual, are we selective for primary or secondary? Secondary, exactly. So our conclusion, our conclusion then, if we compare our observed results to our expected results, is that a secondary hydrogen is roughly three times more reactive towards chlorination compared to a primary. Wonderful. Now, this is where we see something really cool. So for bromination, for bromination, our statistical would be 75 to 25 or six to two odds, just looking, just counting our number of hydrogens. In reality, we have a 97 to three selectivity. So our secondary is preferred. This is a huge jump in selectivity. For bromination, the secondary hydrogen is 97 times more reactive compared to the primary, right? Does that make sense to everyone? Looking at the data, does everyone see that bromination is way more selective? Okay, so that, that's why if you look in the literature, people overwhelmingly do radical bromination over chlorination if they want selectivity for substituted positions. Okay, but we haven't answered the question of why that is. And if we don't understand why that is, we can't actually utilize this in more interesting examples. Well, so we know in principle, the secondary radicals are more stable than primary radicals, okay? We know that the tertiary radical is more stable than the secondary, which is more stable than the primary, which is more stable than the methyl radical, 
due to hyperconjugation. Hyperconjugation is the name of the game in that case. Okay, so I'm going to tell you right away to help us complete this analysis. It was found via experimentation. The selectivity determining step, the rate determining step is radical formation after hydrogen abstraction. Okay, so this is a, this is a data table showing the abstraction step. So this is looking at the abstraction step. Okay. And one thing I'd like you to note, one thing I'd like you to note, uh, we're going to approximate the delta H as analogous to the delta G in this case. And I'd just like you to note, and I'd like you to compare for chlorination, is this chlorination abstraction step. So is the chlorination abstraction step exergonic or endergonic? Is it releasing energy or absorbing energy? It's exergonic. Okay. Okay. So then our transition state will resemble reactants or products for an exergonic reactants. So our transition state is reactant like. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now let's compare to bromination. Let's compare to bromination. Do we notice, is this step exergonic or endergonic? Exergonic or endergonic? For bromination, this step is endergonic. So then, will our transition state resemble our reactants or products? Yes, so we have a product-like transition state. And this is where this, this, this is a critical distinction. So now let's look and see what happens. Now let's look and see what happens. So for bromination, we're looking at our product. For chlorination, we're looking at our relative energies of our reactants. Okay, so already there's a huge difference between these two supposedly very similar mechanisms. Okay, so let's start with chlorination. Let's start with chlorination. So hydrogen abstraction for chlorination is exergonic. So the transition state resembles the alkane and chlorine atoms. Okay, so there's little radical character on the carbon in the transition state. And the regioselectivity is only slightly influenced by radical stability. So looking at these two species, do we notice a substantial difference in energy between these two species? So if we, if we do the math, our delta H is roughly somewhere around four kilojoules if we're lucky. Is that a pretty large or small difference? It's a pretty small difference. Okay. So as chlorination is exergonic, the transition state resembles the reactants and we use the reactants to estimate the energy of our transition state. Now, unfortunately for us, unfortunately for us, as our transition state resembles our reactants that are close in energy, the transition states will be close in energy. And there is a small difference in activation energy for both chlorination pathways. So if we're looking at our reactants, so if we're looking at our reactants, our reactants are functionally, we're dealing with the exact same species. We're dealing with a alkane and a chlorine radical. So if we compare our two transition states, so this is a reactant-like transition state, there's going to be a relatively small difference in energy between our transition states, which is around four kilojoules. 
similar to our difference between our reactants that we calculated. And in turn, this difference is not enough to produce a substantial selectivity. The difference in activation energy is too small. Thus, chlorination has low selectivity despite the difference in product energy. So let me, let me put some, let's use our A and B. So let's suppose this is pathway A and product A. Pathway B and product B. So even though A and B are very different in terms of energy, even though our products are different in energy, does that matter in this reaction at all? Does that matter for our selectivity for this exergonic process? Does this matter for our selectivity when the reaction is exergonic? Do we care about our products? So selectivity is whether we form A or B. Remember for chlorination, remember for chlorination, we observed 45% primary and 55% secondary. The relative proportion of products generated is our selectivity. We have two pathways. It's exergonic, so we have a reactant-like transition state. Our reactants are close in energy, ergo, our transition states are close in energy. Ergo, we don't observe as much selectivity. It doesn't matter the fact our products are different in energy. Not substantially, because our transition state and our relative energy of our transition states is governed by our reactants, which look very similar. That's why we see almost this one-to-one -one selectivity. There is a small amount of selectivity the, sec the secondary is slightly preferred. But it's not preferred by much, right? That's why we observe this three times selectivity rather than 97 times for bromination. Does this make sense to everyone so far? Does everyone, come, does everyone see why chlorination is not very selective? Looking at this graph for an exergonic reaction. Are there any questions I can address? Okay, so let's keep going now and let's look at bromination. So hydrogen abstraction for bromination is endergonic. So the delta G is greater than zero. So the transition state resembles our alkyl radical and HBr. These are our products. There is significant radical character on carbon in the transition state. And in turn, our regioselectivity is greatly influenced by radical stability. So we know that the tertiary radical is more stable than the secondary, which is more stable than the primary. We've seen this song and dance before. So if we look at our product, so if we look at our products and we compare the difference in product energy, this gives us a delta G of about 17 kilojoules. Okay. And I just want you to be familiar with this activation energy difference. When you have an activation energy difference of around 15 to 17, that gives you selectivity of greater than 95 to one. So, our transition state will resemble our product. So looking at the difference in energies of our products, we can assess the difference in energies of our transition states. So let's show the payoff. So bromination is endergonic. We can use the alkyl radical energies to estimate the transition state energies. So as the alkyl radicals that resemble our intermediates have substantially different energies, the transition states have different energies. Thus, bromination is more selective as the transition states have substantially different energies. So let's, let's showcase that. So if this is pathway A and product A, so A would be our secondary, B would be our tertiary. So let's draw that. Oh, sorry, 
A is primary, B is tertiary. Whoops, one moment. Let me just correct that for completeness. Okay, does everyone notice? So first and foremost, our delta G reaction is greater than zero. So looking at our Gibbs energy of activation, this reaction overall is endergonic or this step is endergonic for the, the selectivity determining step. There is a huge difference of activation energy between pathway A, which is our primary bromination pathway and pathway B, which is our tertiary. Because this reaction is endergonic, we can use our products to estimate the relative energy of our transition states. And because product B is lower in energy or because intermediate B is lower in energy, the transition state to generate intermediate B is lower in energy. And that's why the tertiary bromination product is overwhelmingly generated. And because there's a huge difference in our activation energies, there is substantial selectivity. So if our difference in Gibbs energy of activation is greater than about 15 kilojoules, that gives you about 95 to five selectivity. Okay, so why is this important? Why is this skill set matter? Well, what this skill set allows you to do is to look at any reaction and say, well, how does this reaction behave? And what can I do to change the selectivity of my reaction? So it's only by understanding chemical reactions can you begin to change your reaction conditions, modify characteristics of the reaction to produce the desired results, okay? So if we wanted increased selectivity for our halogenation, it would fall to reason that we prefer to attempt bromination over chlorination. Just something to consider. So if you ask, why do people do this? Well, it's usually because the reactions are not, they're similar looking, but they're not always identical in terms of behavior. Does this make sense? Does this help everyone understand how a small change from exergonic to endergonic makes a huge difference in selectivity? and makes a huge difference in what determines selectivity. Okay, so we're gonna see examples of exergonic and endergonic reactions throughout this class. Any questions before I move on to the next topic? Okay, well then let's keep going then. So what we're next gonna do is we're gonna look at different types of reactions. And we're gonna focus on drawing arrow pushing mechanisms for different types of reactions. So the first type of reaction is an addition reaction where it's where two molecules combine, typically an alkene or a ketone. In electrophilic addition, a nucleophilic pi bond is used to form two new sigma bonds. So an example of this is alkene addition, where the alkene is protonated by forming a carbon-hydrogen bond, and then the carbocation is attacked by a nucleophile. This is a boilerplate mechanism that you see a lot for addition reactions. The other class of addition, if this first case would be considered polar addition, is radical addition where a radical adds to a pi bond to form new pi bonds. So in this case, we have a clear radical intermediate that, is, that then abstracts a hydrogen to generate our addition product. Notice if we compare these two different addition pathways, polar versus radical, are they going through different intermediates? Are the polar and radical reaction intermediates the same or different? 
just looking at the structure. Is a carbocation the same thing as a radical from the purposes of, so are, let me rephrase it. So do these intermediates look the same? They're different, right? They're obviously different. One's a carbocation, the other's a radical. And as a result, both the transition states for both of these processes, the rate determining step for both of these reactions, and in turn, the potential regioselectivity and stereoselectivity will be different, okay? So even though many reactions, there are multiple reactions used to accomplish the same overall goal, they may have different preferences and different selectivities. Um, if you've been paying close attention, does everyone notice how the halogen ends up on different carbons in both of these reactions? Even though we have the same substrate, does everyone notice how the halogen's on different carbons? Okay, so when we show you different types of reactions in this class, it's important if you, to be able to identify whether they're polar or radical because that in turn influences their product selectivity, okay? And we'll delve in depth to each of these reactions in later chapters. I just really want to get you paying attention to intermediates and how reactions behave. Okay, so the other type of addition is known as nucleophilic addition. It's a nucleophile adding to an electrophilic pi bond to form two new pi bonds, two new sigma bonds. So addition to ketones is quite a common reaction in that category. Okay, so let's keep going now. So we're gonna apply the Hammond postulate now to electrophilic hydrobromination. So we're gonna look at electrophilic hydrobromination of an alkene, and we're gonna apply the Hammond postulate in detail now. So here are each of the unique steps for our reaction. So we have protonation. So that's step one. We have addition. of bromide, that's step two. So looking at this reaction pathway, and this is review, but I, I wanna make sure that we understand how to look at our reaction energy diagram. What is our selectivity determining step? What is our rate limiting step? Step one or step two? What step has the largest activation energy? Step one. So step one is rate determining. Okay, is step one exergonic or endergonic? Is step one exergonic or endergonic? Endergonic. Ergo, the transition state is going to resemble what? What is our transition state gonna resemble? What, what will it resemble? What is our intermediate in this case? So it's gonna resemble the product of step one, which is our intermediate. And what is our intermediate in this case? So our transition state is gonna resemble, what is our intermediate? Our carbocation intermediate. So our transition state is gonna resemble the following species. Okay, good, good. Everyone's good at that. Okay, so let's take a look at two competing pathways for electrophilic hydrobromination of the following alkene. So product A, product B. Wonderful. Okay. So this is in, so we have transition state B, intermediate B, transition state A, intermediate A. Okay. So my question to all of you is, 
my question to all of you is, looking at this reaction, looking at this reaction, we've established that this is an endergonic step, right? So my question to all of you is, why is B preferred over A? Why is B preferred over A? So what makes B a lower energy intermediate? What makes B a lower energy intermediate? So someone mentioned placement of the carbocation. What is a more stable carbocation? Primary or tertiary? Which carbocation is lower in energy? Tertiary, yep. So the tertiary carbocation is more stable. And as a result, transition state for B is lower in energy. Okay, now let's try and, and classify. Let's try and think for a moment. Is, what, would we, what would we call A? Is A the kinetic thermodynamic or neither? So what's the, what's the kinetic product in this case? What's the kinetic product? What product is preferred based on activation energy? B, yep. Yeah. So B is the kinetic product. Is, what is the thermodynamic product? What's the lower energy product overall? B, yep. So B is the kinetic product and it's the thermodynamic product. So they're not necessarily always different products. Okay, perfect. So everyone's comfortable analyzing these reaction diagrams. So if we're looking through sort of mechanistically, so we'd have our intermediate B, our intermediate A. In this case, B, this product here is the kinetic and thermodynamic product. Perfect. Wonderful. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take some moments and we're gonna practice drawing out some of these mechanisms using arrow pushing notation. So this is your first introduction towards drawing mechanisms. So I'm gonna do the first example and you'll do the second. So we're looking at nucleophilic addition of phenylithium to acetone, okay? So we, are, we have to break this pi bond and form a sigma bond. So for nucleophilic addition, you always draw your arrow going from your electron pair to your source of positive charge or your electrophilic site. So this would be our nucleophile, which is our source of electron density. And here is our electrophile, which is electron deficient. So we're gonna push our arrow to our most electrophilic carbon. Remember, looking at acetone, this carbon has a delta plus charge. And then we're gonna push our electrons up as we've broken our pi bond. And that in turn gives us the following product. Okay, so let's take a moment and I'd like you now to practice drawing the radical addition of ethane thiol to 2-methyl-prop-1-ene. So I just want you to draw the first radical addition step. And remember, for radicals, we draw them with the fish hook notation, half arrow notation, because we're describing the movement of single electrons. So look at your products, look at your reactants, and make sure that you're forming the desired bonds. We need a bond between sulfur and this carbon here. So um, if for those who want, if someone would like to volunteer and use the annotate feature, you're more than welcome 
to break out the annotate feature and try drawing out a mechanism for this step if someone is willing to volunteer. Let me just reset one note really quickly just because it's giving me a small error that I want to correct. Okay, here we go. Let's zoom in. And now would anyone like to draw this radical addition mechanism? You're more than welcome to break out the annotate function. If not, you're also welcome to try drawing it out at home separately. But I want to make sure everyone gives an attempt at this before we discuss as a group. So don't be shy to break out the annotate feature or try to draw out this mechanism at home over the next three to four minutes, and then we'll discuss. Okay, that's one of the electrons in our bond. Where's the other electron coming from? Okay, you're almost there. And is the sulfur going to the correct carbon in that case? But it's very, very close. Yep. Yep. And then where does the second electron go in that double bond? Since this is radical, we're, we're pushing single electrons. Where does the second electron go in that double bond? It's perfect so far. It just needs one more arrow to complete it. Let me help since we're almost there. Um, I'm just going to clear. That was very good. That was very good. So you got the, the regio selectivity correct. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our radical and we're going to fish hook push it to form a bond with this carbon. Now we need two electrons to form a bond. So we're going to use our fish hooks and we're going to take our two electrons in this double bond, push one to form a single bond, and the other to end up on our carbon. That was very good. The middle carbon is attached to three carbons. That's correct. Would someone like to comment on this selectivity? Why did why why do we form the radical at this position? Would someone like to take a guess? Why is this radical formed preferentially? Is that a low or high energy radical? Yeah, it's a low energy radical. Okay. This next step we're looking at electrophilic addition our old friend, would someone like to open up the annotate feature and give an attempt at this mechanism? If not, we'll review it in about three minutes, but I want to give everyone an opportunity if they want to practice with me providing feedback or if they want um, to get feedback from their classmates. Um, and note, since you know the products, you have a sense of where everything's going to end up. This is a reaction we've studied extensively using the Hammond postulate. So let's try to remember the steps and let's, um, if someone could volunteer with the annotate feature, I'd be excited to comment. 
Yep, yep. Exactly right. Most more stable carbocation. So that's a schematic for what happens, but mechanistically in terms of bond formation, when we discussed, when we discussed electrophilic addition, what was the first step? What does this, um, very close, very close. So how do we make our carbocation in the first step? What's our nucleophilic species? What's our electron rich species? So let's talk about this and I'll provide a little bit more guidance for this one. And then we'll, we'll do some more examples um, just to provide everyone a little bit of guidance here. So our first step for electrophilic addition is protonation, protonation of our alkene. So this hydrogen is electron deficient. This alkene is electron rich and we attack to generate the most stable carbocation. So this intermediate is generated preferentially over all our, our alternative intermediate shown here because tertiary beats out primary. Next, we have our chloride anion and it can just attack the carbocation to generate our desired product. So the steps are protonation followed by attack. And we'll be doing a lot of review. Yes, Mitchell, that's exactly right. The pi bond electrons, we form our carbon hydrogen bond at the secondary carbon to generate the lowest energy carbocation. That's exactly right. And as we've seen previously for these electrophilic addition reactions, uh, in terms of selectivity, the faster protonation step occurs when you're generating the more stable tertiary carbocation. Now, don't worry if, if when you're drawing mechanisms, it seems a little bit overwhelming at first glance. This is just our first attempt at, un, at drawing mechanisms now that we've seen and we've viewed reaction coordinates. So we'll be doing a lot more practice drawing mechanisms and arrow pushing. This is just our introduction to the idea of arrow pushing. Let me reset one note really quickly. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about bond breaking steps and addition steps. So for homolytic cleavage, we have symmetrical bond breaking. Whoops, let me just check. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now let's look at some bond forming and bond breaking steps that are used a lot in chemical reactions. So homolytic cleavage, we have symmetrical bond breaking where electrons in a bond are evenly distributed to the two atoms as the bond is broken. 
So another example of this is if we're looking at peroxides, for example, when heated, they also undergo heterolytic, oh, sorry, homolytic bond cleavage. So we draw these with fish hook arrows. Remember this fish hook signifies movement of one electron each. So in polar addition, which is what we see a lot in polar reactions involving carbocations, our two bonding electrons are donated by one reactant. So in this case, our equivalent of cyanide is donating these two electrons. So we use a double-headed arrow to signify two electrons moving. For heterolytic bond cleavage, the electrons shared between our two atoms in a chemical bond are distributed to one atom during bond breaking. So for example, in an ionization step, our bromine leaves, and this arrow is saying this bromine receives both of the electrons in the carbon-bromine bond. Other examples of bond forming steps would be termination, where two radicals react to generate a stable product. So we have two radicals and we use fish hook notation to showcase the movement of one electron each to give a two electron bond. So other examples of this, so you have a, if you have a hydrogen radical and a halogen, they can also terminate using one electron each to generate a bond that has two electrons. So these are some common steps that are often replicated and repeated a lot in reaction mechanisms. Okay, so let's talk next about the alternative to addition reactions, which are elimination reactions. So elimination reactions occur based on the idea that we're forming a pi bond by breaking one or more sigma bonds. So there are a few major elimination reactions and we'll delve more into this in a later chapter. But in an E1 reaction, we have loss of the leaving group to form a cation, followed by elimination of H plus to yield a pi bond. So step one, we lose our leaving group. And then once we have our cation, we eliminate H plus to form our pi bond. In an E2 reaction, we have concerted loss of the leaving group and H plus. So both our leaving group and H plus leave at the same time. Okay. The other type of reaction that you'll primarily see in Chem 112, not as much, oh, 113, sorry, not as much in this class is one to elimination where we have loss of a leaving group to reform a carbon nitrogen or carbon oxygen pi bond. In this case, electrons are kicked down from our oxygen and our leaving group leaves as a result. Okay. The last major type of elimination, which is a variant, which is related a little bit to E2, E1 and E2. It's called E1CB, where we lose a proton to generate an anion, and then we eliminate our leaving group at the beta position. Okay. The E just means elimination. Yes, that's correct. Now, elimination reactions can occur even across conjugated systems where you can kick out leaving groups that are adjacent to conjugated systems. So another example of this would be So if you have this chloride and you treat it with a base, 
So in our first step, the base would remove a proton. This is a classic E1CB reaction. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to predict whether it's E1, E2, or E1CB just yet. The logic behind drawing mechanisms can be thought of in terms of arrow pushing, very similar to drawing resonance structures. Yes, that's correct. For now, what I want you to be able to do is if I show you the reactant and I show you the product, I'd like you to be able to draw reasonable movements of electrons to get from the reactant to the product. And we'll delve more into detail into each of these reactions in later chapters. So to show another example of elimination across conjugated systems, we can generate our anion at this position and then kicking through our conjugated system, we can eliminate our chloride. Okay, so this chapter, and this is a good stopping point for today. So when I go over all of these reactions, what I want you to slowly become familiar with is just how are electrons pushed in substitution, elimination, bond forming and bond breaking reactions. Because what we're going to do is we're gonna use each of these individual steps, each of these individual steps when we're describing more complicated reaction mechanisms. So by understanding each of these fundamental steps and understanding at least how to draw these fundamental steps, when you're asked to draw a mechanism in the future, you will not have as much trouble with drawing out the movements of electrons. I'm not asking you to memorize each of these reactions just yet. We will see these reactions later on and I just want you to get used to drawing a structure and just showing how are electrons moving in this mechanism. Does that make sense to the expectations? I don't want you to feel too overwhelmed. This is just a survey chapter right now. We will look at each of these reactions in painstaking detail in the later chapters. But for now, I just want you to know these reactions exist. This is how electrons move and hey, let's just practice showing the movement of electrons. And that's what I want out of you for now. Just wanting you to start the idea of practicing these mechanisms. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, perfect. So it's currently 6.50, so we're gonna take a 10 minute break and then I'd like to lecture for an hour and a half in lab just to make sure we're caught up. We're almost finished with this chapter, in fact. So I will see everyone in laboratory in 10 minutes. So I'll see everyone. Um, we likely won't start chapter seven today. We'll likely finish chapter six. Yep, perfect. Okay, so I'll see everyone in laboratory at 7.01.